This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been here with with you guys, and uh, I am back, and we are continuing our series on the human game, with this one being about themes and how they affect human evolution and adaptation. And so with me as always for this series, Ms. Sonia Barrett, welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for having me back. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to whatever unfolds. Whatever we end up laughing yeah, about, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be very serious and responsible today. <laughs> uh, <okay>. Right. <laughs> I know you are, and so am I. Right? <laughs> All righty. So, you know, how we kind of decide sometimes where we're going to go with these is that when Zonia and I are having a, a hike or a chat or whatever, we'll get into a topic and she'll be like, you know, I wrote an article about this 675 million years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's more, you know, more pertinent than it was even then. And so, you know, seven seconds before the show, she'll email me the article <laughs> and I'll read it really fast and I'll go, damn, that is a good article. And somehow, like, it almost felt like you were, you talked about the Me Too movement in the article, but you talked about it before the Me Too movement even happened. So you guys, Sonia really is a time traveler, and she is from the future. So <laughs> there's the proof. <laughs> anyway, so themes. Um, you know, you wanted to talk about this. I thought it was really interesting. It, there seems to be, I mean, it's always present, but it does seem that, it's really, really picked up lately. I'd say like, you know, probably the very, very intensely since the election, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been pretty much one, you know, one main theme, the theme of Russia, um, you know, Russia gate, Russian collusion, Russian oh, yeah. this, that, the other thing. Yeah. Um, Robert, Robert and I did a show about the concept of psychic driving and how that was kind of used on a mass scale um, with just constant repetition of certain specific terms related to that. Um, and then there's been a few others that sort of rode along with it and were sort of tangentially related. Things like Me Too and, you know, some of your like Black Lives Matters and the gender kind of wars and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um... yeah. And then now there seems, some of those seem to be drying up. So now we have shootings again in the last few weeks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is, exactly. I'm writing something down so I don't for, forget. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the thing is that when, when we talk about themes, they go even bigger than that because there was the activist theme. Mm -hmm. And it's in a way that people don't really notice. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is a theme happening right now. It's like they don't notice that suddenly it's all about ap activism, like it's this thing. And then it's amazing to me how it will navigate suddenly it's not about activism. You don't really hear that, but then nobody notices because you're just like, your mind is just being like taken to the next thing and then the next thing. And then you're over here. You don't really notice when this change on, change is happening. But yeah, the um, we could say racial theme and people are listening. They'd be go, well, it's always been racial. No, 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 no. You have to understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when something gets a particular kind of feature. And this is something mm -hmm. that, we need to work on um, as human beings is listening and is paying attention um, because there's so much that gets missed because somebody will listen and go, well, that's always been happening. Not hearing what I'm saying. I'm not saying that those things were not happening. I'm speaking about the manner in which they suddenly come to the forefront and they become a featured theme. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about Supreme white supremacy that suddenly has been a huge thing for the last couple of years and then we have to look at the manner in which all of these things feed into the greater theme that could carry us like all year long how they're interconnected mm -hmm. and um and then they carry the 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 experience we'll say particularly then uh if we look at a country in the united states 
um, were, you know, the, the, the Western world period, but we, we just look at this country in particular. They run these various themes and people get pulled into it. The media ensures that whatever theme is running, that they feature, whether it be shootings or, or you know, killings or whatever, they feature it. Not that they were not going on before. So mm -hmm. you can't really tell to what degree something was going on because they decide when they're going to highlight mm -hmm. any kind of theme or feature. The human beings, because we're so Borg-like and, and most people are uh, complete products of the general matrix, even when they don't think that they are, that they easily get navigated, their minds get navigated to, to these um, featured themes and then, and then they become, it becomes part of their languaging and um, mm -hmm. their upsets and all of that, not realizing, you know, the motive or the, the motive behind it. And it, it becomes the sleight of hand trick too, because when we, our minds are directed in that way to these featured themes, um, there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes, but we're also distracted with whatever that new theme is. Okay, case in point, let me throw this out. Remember when suddenly we had the pirate thing, like pirates were like <laughs> hijacking, not hijacking, but kept kidnapping people, you know, on the, yeah. on the high seas. And then that was like a theme for a while. Right, the Somalian, the Somalian pirates, yeah. Right, and then we would hear about like one family in particular, they featured them. Then suddenly we didn't hear about it, but you don't notice that you didn't hear about it. Then one day you go, I wonder what happened to that family. Like they, nobody ever came back and told us, you know, yeah. <laughs> nobody ever came back and told us, oh, cause we're on to this other new theme now. We're not doing that one anymore. Yeah. And, and yeah. it goes on with the weather too, you know, with, with, with the hurricanes and the fires and the, you know, it's, it's just like this nonstop of people. So funny you should mention the thing about pirates because that came up yesterday. I was walking with a friend and we walked by, uh, you know, over by Sherman Oaks Fashion Square. They have one of those Halloween superstores. And she's like, a Halloween superstore super right now? I'm like, oh yeah, it's always there. There's always. a lot, of, always there. There's a lot of people in Los Angeles like obsessed with dressing up all the time, especially like a lot of like the Burning Man people. I was like, it can be a Tuesday afternoon, you're in the middle of downtown Los Angeles, and there's some person walking down the street dressed like a pirate. Well, one of the things, you know, all of a sudden, like, in probably some 2008, 2010, something like that, right, about that same time with some of those Somali pirate things, like, that became the trend. All these people who are into, like, certain aspects of what they think is a rebellious culture, like Burning Man, they're all dressed like pirates all the time. Like, they walk around. <laughs> so, like... The ripples of, like, but those, but it's like, which one was the intention? Was the simulation programming there to be really pirates kidnapping families? Or was the simulation programming, you know, people to, you know, arr, dress up like, you know what I mean? Like, what is it? But why are we, why, I, but very quickly, about 10 years ago, we started to see this rise of theme of pirates. And I guess you could say it was a little bit before that with, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, right? With Johnny Depp and with the Jack Sparrow and the braided little chin hair and all that kind of stuff and sort of romanticizing the uh, pirate thing. But it is weird. Like when you think about stories that captured our mind for so, remember, how, remember one of the biggest ones for me was, remember when the little girl fell down the well, Jessica? Oh, yeah, yeah. And remember how for like a few days, that was all, I mean, the whole world was, oh my God, the baby's in the well. What they do? That's exactly what, what they do. Anybody know where baby to our sets, um, right? Yeah. And we were all sitting there being traumatized because they're showing how they're getting. You know, like I remember watching. There was like a TV movie made about it, and I had like a panic attack while I was watching because I'm claustrophobic. And they were showing the guy like they made another pipe down and then they went over and when he was going over he's like in this little bit you know he's like a spelunker right and I'm watching him in that tight little space and I'm having a panic attack on the couch but everybody mission accomplished <laughs> exactly, exactly. Very good back. right well I had, I had wanted gymnastics meet that day right so I should be feeling good and instead I'm shriveled up in a ball on a couch having a panic attack about the baby Jessica thing but I, I have no idea what happened the emotional to response is I mean you know is a big part of of it and we have to keep remembering that 
everything is just another show. Everything mm -hmm. is just another show. And it just constantly keeps the mind engaged. It's, it's, it's constant. That's, that's a show right there. Um, and the news is a show. The car chases is a show. Right. It's fascinating how people will sit and, and, and watch a car <laughs> chase. It is the dumbest thing ever. Right. They, they, you, you know, so they, and, and they will cover it. There was one like a couple months ago and my husband had it on and I am just fascinated with the foolishness. And I, and I was looking at it, I go, this is so stupid. I pass by and I'm like, okay, watch the, look at how many times they're going to keep going over the same questions. Uh, it, it's like dumb, dumb statements like, um, yeah. Uh, what do you think? Do you, do you think he's going really fast? Or, you know, just stupid. <laughs> right. Do you think he's, he's going really fast? Or um, do you think they're going to, the cops are going to catch him? Just, just like dumb things because they're, they're, they run out of things. It's like, and the same thing with the fire. Do you think, do you think the cops are going to catch him? We live in a society where everything is surveilled, tracked, and traced 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I and mean, the fact that people, anybody thinks they can get away from the cops like that is hilarious. But here's the thing. It'll keep people, you know, probably several tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Distracted. Right. But think about this. They, no one ever hears about what happens to the person once the police catch them. And no. nobody ever follows up. Nobody cares. No, because you, you're on to the next show. Because they're ready. As soon as that show ends, they're ready with the, it's like somebody's b uh, behind the set going, okay, next, bring, bring that. Oh, great. We can stop running this now because now we have a 10 car pileup. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. So everything is totally contrived. I want to circle back to where we started with this about activism, right? Because yeah. I think like, you know, I mean, I'm sure on some level there's always been sorts of activism, right? But when like people really started paying attention to it was probably in the 60s with both the anti-war movement and like Martin Luther King kind of stuff, right? Right. But and even then it was a different time. I don't know. It's, it's really weird, Emily. Yes, there are times there's uh, throughout history where there have been activists, activism, but there is a way that activism in this time was popping up. It's a completely different um, generation of people that are moving about in activism. Okay, when we had uh, Martin Luther King um, Jr. and they and and okay, I'm just talking in the Black Panther movement and right. all of this. That, that was like a completely like different time of activism. What I yes. see now is people want to jump on the bandwagon of being featured, being part of something. One, we have social media. We have there's more exposure. People like to be part of something. So I saw a lot of that. They just want to be part of something. They was like, oh, this is really cool to be doing this. Oh yeah, I'm out here and I'm doing this. Oh yeah, I'm standing here and I'm holding up a sign. It, it's it's a lot of that, and then it fades away. So it's not necessarily that deep um, reasoning for fighting for a cause, but mainly a lot of people that end up end up jumping on the bandwagon of being part of this trending theme of being an activist right now. And then it then it just dies down some. Like right now, it kind of died down. A yeah. Little bit. Yeah. Well, what's interesting to me about it is, so with, with anti-war movement in the 60s and 70s, right, and with like Martin Luther King and the Bach Panthers and stuff like that, the government, the corporations, the would-be controllers, they had to create programs to try and break these things up or destroy them or distract them, you know, and they did that with creating, you know, different kinds of street game games, you right, know, the black community. Yeah. And then for the people who are part of the anti-war movement, creating the hippie Woodstock, getting right. people all involved in acid and drugs and free love mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. So there was a lot of time and energy spent into how do we stop these movements? What exactly. seems to have changed is that now they spend a lot of time investing in how do we start these movements? Exactly. How do we create? It's yes. the same people. So the same people yes. that used to try to stop them at a certain point figured out like, oh, well. We can use it to our advantage. Yeah. yeah. And the, you know, one of my favorite people, I don't know if you ever, how familiar you are with the work of um, 
Dave McGowan. He wrote that weird scenes inside the canyon about the whole hit thing with the Laurel Canyon music scene and how it was really run by mm-hmm. military intelligence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He also wrote a book that received a lot less attention called Program to Kill, where he talked about right. the whole thing right. with the serial killers and stuff like that being a creation of intelligence to do the same kind of thing that the mass shootings are doing now. And he mm-hmm. got onto this really before a lot of other people started to notice mm-hmm. this. And, you know, he's, he's gone, unfortunately. Um, but the way he documented that, and then you can really tie that into, okay, so that became, like, that was a, an awful lot of work to have to go and create these big programs to do that. It's much easier just to give some obnoxious kid, you know, a, a $100,000 to start a website or to, you know, or to start, you know, some sort of movement, get George Soros to back some Black Lives Matter or some Antifa. And then we can, you know, control the movement from that side. But what's, you know, and, and now we have on the flip side, you have all these, you know, there was not really uh, any kind of white supremacy problem. There's a few gross white supremacists out there. There always have been. There always will be there. You pretty much have no power and whatever. But they created this alt-right movement, right? Like I, I would step far out on a ledge, really far out here and say that, at the, bo- at, the, in, at the bottom of the pocket, the same thing that funds Black Lives Matter and the alt-right, you'll find the same foundations. Well, this, same is, people. this, is, this is the sad part about it is that um, a lot of these, yeah, you're right, a lot of these um, featured, uh, what should I say, what do we call them, um, activist type experiences or projections, um, there's a lot of interception of, yeah, Mm -hmm. all of those powerful um, forces that are behind um, a great many things. But to tell, you know, to tell a lot of people that it's like, why would they do that? I mean, it's kind of a really touchy weird thing in terms of looking at it that way. But then again, they've infiltrated everything. That's just everything about life has been infiltrated in that manner um, in terms of what the general public, what we're going to believe. I mean, because they own the media. It's the same, the same people that own these, these, uh, yeah, these platforms um, that, are, that we call the media. But all these platforms that allow uh, access to the world or to that many people from the internet on. Yeah. yeah those, uh, those people are able to project or to create or to establish what it is that they want to have um, happening from, from religion on, from cult on. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's massive. It's just massive. It's interesting too how they use one created theme to distract from another created theme. theme. Like when somebody starts to figure out that, oh, this might've been created, then they have a new one ready to insert to distract for a bit. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Truth Stream Media, Melissa Melton and Aaron Dykes. They're two who sort of defected from the Alex Jones camp, and they make great, great videos. Their stuff right. is really good. Mm-hmm. But Melissa actually went and figured out, mm-hmm. she did a lot of correlation, that every time there's a mass shooting, mm-hmm. there was like an illegal war crime committed that day in Syria, right, that is not getting covered, right? Yeah. So they started this one theme, this one nonsense with the Syria, right? Mm-hmm. And when people start to figure out, like, oh, the white helmets are fake, and that was created, and they're actually all that kind of crap, well, then suddenly anytime something happens with that, then there's one of these shootings. And so nobody's paying attention to that. So now you have like, you know, themes competing with each other. Right. <laughs> All create. And, and I also want to point out that you realize that um, YouTube has taken, is taken down video and took down, I, I guess, a whole lot of videos. Anything mm-hmm. that relates to um Sandy Hook, anybody talking yeah. negatively about that? He took down a bunch of a bunch of folks um, in the last last week. Well, now they just take down people who are just yeah. almost just virtually normal white right wingers, like your run of the mill standard conservative who doesn't believe in all the identity politics. They get taken down. Yeah, you know what I mean. But yeah. yeah, it is weird some of the stuff that they're going back and taking down and 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 removing. And uh, G- uh, James Corbett calls it them too. I like that. I think that's more accurate. Yeah. Not YouTube, well, it's them too. Well, my whole thing is this, because a long time ago when I did Sovereign Mind Radio, <clears throat> Sovereign Mind Magazine, as we've talked about, I was in a, a very different space. Um, I was still more in the conspiracy fight space, mm-hmm. um, but I'm in a different space. 
where I can come at this from a different angle mm -hmm. and the angle that I come at it from um, far exceeds the, that angle. Yeah. I was coming from there. So, so what I say is that, you know, if, if one wants to do battle with YouTube or, you know, whatever, then fine. But if you have something profound, like deep that you want to talk about like that huge, then put it on a platform where, you know, where that, that won't happen. So right. I think people have to learn to pick their battles because even that is, um, you're also being prompt or prompted or, or instigated. It, this is a war planet and people need to realize mm -hmm. that this planet and, is all about war yeah, and, and fighting, fighting yeah, all just, the time. Yeah, always fighting all the time. So you have to like choose because there's a reason why it's, you're triggered to, you know, to fight back and to argue back because the system feeds off of it. It feels, it feeds off of that, that energy of this conflict and that fight. So you're constantly being, you know, pushed in one way or another. And people think, especially conspiracy people, they think, you know, well, yeah, I'm going to show them, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, okay, but no, you're just actually playing right into, right into it, into, into their hands. You, you've got to see how you're doing that. Because the system has been added. Those who are at the helm of the system that has that kind of control, they've been at it for such a very long time that your one little whatever it is you're doing um, is not going to make it come crashing down. They have, they have mastered it. So you have to cut, figure another way to operate around that construct that doesn't involve the thing that feeds that machine and and that's kind of how i see it it's like okay well i see i see how this system is designed now i'm gonna find another way to mm -hmm. to go up to come out around it so that your mind doesn't get sucked in and you become just another part of the construct that feeds the collective theme um the, the collective birth to death um, the thing, let's work, you brought up this fighting and war planet thing, and, and, and I think that's, you know, it's been a long running theme, this fighting thing, but the way, I mean, there's a few things, you know, to, to fight for, right? If you're being attacked, you fight, you know, physically. If someone is harming you, you fight right. back. Yeah, right? yeah, but different the, kinds of fighting, different, different kind of forms things, of defending. The one. kind of things people think are harming them now are hilarious to me. Right, right. Like, you know, people getting their feelings hurt, people, you know, arguments on Facebook, arguments on YouTube, you know, like this kind of... Um, people are more emotionally fragile because the system, the system has, it's created a platform that, that is really creating this kind of fragile, emotionally fragile folks. You know, Emily, and there are people out there that will probably maybe get upset with me for saying this, but... Um, even when I looked at the bullying theme, yes, I understand that with social media, with technology, there is, you know, the people can spread more information about you, um, on, on the internet. But when did the, our children, when did we get that fragile though? And so overly sensitive mm -hmm. that we cannot handle that at all. That a nine year old child feels like, oh, she wants to commit suicide. Now the media feeds into the bullying. They make it look like they're helping, but they're not. What no. they're doing is they're feeding mm -hmm. the idea of bullying and how wrong it is and and how you basically, and how it is damaging people. So they're actually conditioning you to go, yeah, well, yeah, they're right. Well, my feelings were hurt. I really am starting to feel depressed over how I was treated. So they're actually, so it's this this underlying, you know, thing that is being done yeah. that, that people don't notice. And you're just going, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I do feel depressed. Yeah. Well, it, well, the other thing that's funny is how it's led to, like, a breakdown in common sense. Because, like, when you see people recommend, when you see people suggesting what to do to stop bullying or what to happen if your child is bullied, you see, you know, there's some people that think, like, reporting something to Facebook or calling the police, that, that's the suggestion that comes before just shutting the computer and t turning it off. Yeah. Right? Like, the, right? Like, so that, that part is interesting to me. 
Yeah, how about just don't just how about just shut it off? I'm always like, how about just turn it off? And right, how about just turn it off? Right? Like to me, like that's the whole like the, the whole thing. Like the the bullies love when you engage, right? And I think the other thing that all of this like stuff is done. Like one of the best experiences and most important experience a kid has in their life is standing up to the bully on the playground, right? The bully is mean, and the bully is usually mean because they are lacking self confidence themselves in some area. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they bother somebody who's smaller than them or weaker than them or young, younger than them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And as long as you continue to run and hide in the corner or tell the teacher or cry, the bully continue to do it. The moment you get right up in the bully's face, mm -hmm. the moment you get right up in the bully's face and don't move when he tries to get you to move, Mm -hmm. it's usually when either the bully turns around and runs away or you and the bully become best friends. Uh, oh, that's, hey, let me tell you, I, I tell you. It's an important experience. It is a very important experience. And I'll tell you um, a story about that real quickly. But also, um, I'm writing that down. Uh, but also, what is interesting is the, the conditioning that is happening when people are becoming more fragile in that sense and sensitive, especially starting from being from a kid, it's actually shaping them to be uh, to conform more. It's actually a way to shape mm-hmm. the future uh, construct or the future system. Because if if people are like that, then they're going to be uh, easier. They're going to conform and, and much easier, and they're going to be able to be controlled much easier. So it's a very subtle, cunning, it's mm-hmm. subtle, cunning ways in which they begin to shape a society because they, you know, the societies are shaped like a hundred years and, you know, they, they're designing gradually and it's passed mm-hmm. on to what it's going to look like in 10 years or, or 50 years or a hundred years. It's this gradual process that is happening. And suddenly we have a more fragile um, and, and vo- uh, vulnerable and gullible and controllable um, folks in the workplace mm-hmm. and in the school system and group mind thinking. Yep. All of that. Yep. The other thing, the other thing that came along at the same time as this was this like maybe a little bit before, right? But they're connected. Is this idea that like uh, every kid gets a trophy, right? Every kid is a winner. And this is another important. Like did, when I came in second in a gymnastics meet when I was a kid, I didn't like that. I wanted to be first. Right. right? And so it taught me to work harder. To you strive I mean? for something. Right? And, yeah. and, and the worst was when I didn't place it all and I didn't get a ribbon and I didn't get a medal, right? And it usually didn't happen again the next time, right? right. But, you know, so you know, obviously, like, I understand. There are kids with varying levels of skills and abilities and stuff like that. But just this idea that no matter what you do, you get a reward or a yeah. treat or a toy or a whatever. Like, how does a child ever learn that, oh, I see this person who did better than me, maybe they worked harder. I'm gonna go work hard and see what happens. It's not even the idea in mind of beating somebody or uh, anything like that, but, uh uh-oh, hold on a second. Something is funny is happening. Okay, I hope I'm not gonna look like somebody. Lately, Zoom keeps trying to kick kick off. I don't know if Randy logged into something, but I think we're okay here. Oh, um, okay. so, um, any, yeah. that, that, that thing that happens when you didn't work your hardest and you had a disappointment and then the thing to work harder, like these are really important experiences for kids to have when they're young. It's important that their parent, the parent not try and save the child from those, you know, sad feelings, you know, it's fine to comfort your child and to give them a chance for a pep talk and whatever. But, you know, th- that is not the moment to, you know, to say, oh, it doesn't actually matter, you know, whether you did the best or not. You're a winner, too. Right. That isn't, you know, like. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a winner at losing. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah. Right. I know it's so wrong. No, but, um, but it's true. It's, it's, it's true. true. And it's like, OK, you did. You didn't like the way that felt. OK, well, let me, you know, but but I hear it. Oh, let me tell the audience if you're wondering. Why I'm looking so shiny? My air conditioner is broken, and it's hot in here. It, it went in the co- over the course of one week. Yeah. yeah, it w- it went over the course of one week in Los Angeles from like a really like long icky winter and barely any days over seventy to over a hundred degrees. And so on the same day that that happened, everybody's air conditioning broke. Yeah, it's so, yes. It's really hot. <laughs> you know, so people aren't going. Oh, Sonia having a hot flash? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm I'm hot. This is you I'm are hot. hot. 
Sonia, there is no doubt you well, are. Well, I am. Okay, <laughs> let's, just, let's just own that. Yes, I am. However, this is a different kind of hot. <laughs> it really is hot in here. Heat hot. I'm like, oh my it's God. It's getting God. hot in here. Yeah. <laughs> that's, really close. Now, that's another video. That's a different video. Yeah. Right. But, um, but I wanted to tell that, that story because you're talking about bullying. And some people out there will go, oh, that was so mean. We we're going to tell it anyway, because this is what Let's it is. Let's hear it. Okay, so um, when my kids were younger, my boys are three, they're three years apart. And where we lived, there was this kid who lived right there in, um, this was this community, and he, they, he lived there. And he would always be kind of a bully. And my, my older son... You know, he, he didn't really want to get fight him because they're not, we always taught him, you know, defend yourself, but, you know, don't yeah. start a fight. But he did, would really rather not because this guy was so forceful. And so one day he, um, I looked through the window and I saw this happening again where he was, the kid was bullying him and he was like backing down and then he came in the house and I told him at the moment, I said, you know what? You need to get outside and you need to fight that kid right now because if you come back in, I'm kicking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and he went back outside and he did. He he finally just stood up to him mm -hmm. and um and then after that we were like really good friends. Like for yep. they became really great friends after that. And it was funny because my younger one, oh, I think maybe maybe he was like five at the time, might have been five or, or six. And he's out there. He's little, all right. And he's like on the guy's back because he'll fight. He's like climbing on. <laughs> he's like holding on to him. He's like punching him while his brother. <laughs> 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 well, his brother is like getting at him and it's so funny and then after that they all got along and they built forts together and he and that had was, that was for him children. and he felt good about himself after that and that, that's children and it's also adults I mean so I have a story when I started working at the restaurant that I work at right like I started working there after uh, when I was making a major transition in my life you know, from having really been a hermit for about 10 years, which I understand people see me as super outgoing and social now, but the truth of the matter was is that I was, you know, barely left my house for about 10 years. And some of that was, you know, the overwhelm with all the consumption of information, but there was other stuff going on for me. And um, I was having a hard time transitioning into being around people all the time. I had worked in the restaurant industry before that, and I was going back to doing that. And the first day I was working at this place, the girl who was training me, like, mm -hmm. I was super hyper. I was really on edge because, like, you know, you don't, you, when you've gone from being like this, and then you're out with people, either you're really withdrawn or you're super, like, you know, I was really on edge and mile a minute talking worse than I do now and just very yeah. like too much too much I could feel it in my own body you know yeah. and at a certain point she just turned around to me and she was like you are really smart and you are really good at this and you're way more than qualified for this job but you are too much and you need to tone it down and yeah. I had that moment where like I, I hear I was like you know in my late early late 30s or early 40s or whatever right mm. and like trying to hold back the tears because oh, yeah. it's embarrassing yeah. Yeah. right yeah. and you but stupid but, you feel yeah you know, all of that felt, but at, deep down in my heart mm -hmm. i and she is she has one of those personality types that some people could perceive as being a little bit bullying because she's mm -hmm. a little bit rough sometimes she's aggressive mm -hmm. right but but deep down in my heart i knew she was right so mm -hmm. i didn't get reactive i just listened to it took it whatever right mm -hmm. and uh, the next day I came back and I was working with her again and it got better and things smoothed over. Mm -hmm. And about a year later, we started to strike up a friendship and now she is one of my, we were always, we were friendly, but we started to really connect. She is one of my very, very best friends. She would do anything. Yeah. For me. She would yeah. beat anybody's ass. She tried to mess with me. But yeah. she told me when we first started becoming closer that when she left the restaurant that day and got in her car, she sat there for a minute and she felt she didn't know if she had done the right thing or not. She felt really, she could tell that it had stung me and she didn't know if she'd really hurt me. But that was, she didn't do it to be obnoxious. She did it to help me and, and whatever. But she sat there not knowing if she should come back in and apologize to me or, or, or whatever. And I'm glad she did. It was the truth. 
And I, I what you needed at the time. I made the shift that I needed to make. Your kid needed to stand up to somebody. Mm-hmm. That bully was there for your kid. You know? It, yeah, that's right. And and those in those experiences is gonna take that child through life. And and people most well, some people just don't get that. That one moment could have been a defining, the defining moment that would forever change the course of that person's life to know that when, when I run when I run into brick walls or situations, I can get myself out. I'm okay. Yeah. But if you never have any resources mm-hmm. there to, to, you know, to draw on, you're waiting for someone to save you all the time. And so having, you know, so we talk about survival. There's two different things where I say, yeah, we're, you know, we're running survival programs. Yeah. There is, running survival programs, and then there is the core idea of survival skills. They're mm-hmm. absolutely essential because we do use it as well to launch ourselves into um, all of this consciousness stuff that we want. We, we still do have to have that, but survival skills uh, and instincts is extremely important. It ties right in eventually into our intuition and all of that. You can only develop a survival skill by being bullied occasionally, by having your feelings hurt occasionally, by working hard for something and still failing at it, even though you worked hard for it. These are how you hone those survival skills so that you then don't have to buy into a survival program. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And and you mentioned that, you know, my really good friend, um, We've known each other. She's a couple of years older than me, but I was 12 mm-hmm. when we met. She, as a matter of fact, she was just here over the weekend. <laughs> I was 12. And, um, you know, and this you mean, actually, you, you mean you're not still 12? Well, 13. <laughs> <laughs> just about, just about. <laughs> just about, just about. Kind of mature for my age. Yes, everybody, we, we giggle like teenagers and everybody looks at us like we're obnoxious children when we're sitting in a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we, when, when we first met, and again, this is from Jamaica. This is how long I've known her. Yeah. Um, that was like my last bit of time be, living in Jamaica before I end up moving to the U.S. And um, yeah, we would catch the bus because we, went to, we both went to Catholic, the same Catholic school. We'd catch the bus together and that's how we started talking. We lived around the corner from each other. And then one day, out of nowhere, she somehow got it in her head that I said something that I didn't, I didn't mean anything. And she just was like, she was going to beat me up. <laughs> and I was just like, because they used to call me Cricket. Because I, you know, I was always the littlest one. <laughs> yeah. It was always called me Cricket. And she was going to beat me up. And I was like, oh, my God. And then she, we didn't talk for a while. And then, um, then we ended up talking again. Here, what happened, we became like, like best, 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 best friends. Here it is, how many years later? We've known each other for almost, okay, well, that, people already know how old I am. But, you know, we've known each other for 40 years? More than, well, I guess it's more than that. Yeah, it's, it, we've known each other for like a long time. And you see how... That situation, I mean, I was okay. I didn't like freak out like, oh my God, you know. Um, I handled it, but it was in a diplomatic way and it was okay. So all of these things are super important. Even people at work, even adults right now, at their jobs where they're getting, um, feel like they're being bullied or manipulated or uh, somebody is making them feel bad about themselves and you know, and some people go through their work life with this kind of behavior from job to job, this mm-hmm. kind of experience from job to job. That's a sign that it's time for you to own your power. That's what that says to me. Yeah. That's a sign that it's just time for you to stand up and own your power. And then it will stop. But those people keep presenting themselves because of something that you still need to learn. Yeah, right? absolutely. I, 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 when you, when, anytime you're having a Groundhog's Day experience where you're having something over and over and over again, right, then it's that. So one of the things that was interesting in your article, and this le- kind of goes into, I think part of this frailing of society mm. is to really um, move people even more than, I mean, well, there's always been a certain level of group consciousness because of tribal tribalism and, mm-hmm. and family and clan and nation and whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But there's been a very strong push 
for things like socialism and collectivism and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, collective consciousness and then the new age and spiritual and conspiracy communities mm -hmm. and care about unity consciousness and all of this kind of stuff and really getting people to put the group before themselves to... I'm sorry. I was trying to see if I put the light, because the lights, oh my God, it's hot. But ah. anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, to put group before individual and to make the individual feel like they need the group. Right? Oh my God, yeah. And you said that group mind. It's, not, it's not to reject groups. Groups are really important, right? But the strength of a group comes in the individuals being allowed to dissent from the overall opinion of the group and not be, oh, well, then you can't be part of the group. And this is one of the things that I think, you know, in this, you know, because whether it's the intention behind what we're doing or just what is happening, we here in the alternative media find ourselves in this mm -hmm. pool, tide pool here with everybody kind of looking over it, right? And people, you know, like get into this shit where if you disagree about this, if you don't think the earth is flat, if you don't think that, you know, it was a, a oh, they get all in a whatever, all this kind of thing, Just like where, which is what makes the group so attackable, right? Like what happened? What, why, why can't it just be that members of the group can have a disagreement and it doesn't mean that one of them is an evil person or a bad person or whatever. Cause it you know? sort of starts to disqualify. It threatens that person's, um, uh, belief system, whatever, whatever the theory is or idea, whatever, I think it threatens that this is why all the groups um, send people out to recruit, you know, to recruit more people. The more people that agree with whatever the idea is, the more solid that concept becomes and the more that people are invested and believe in it. And I think that's what it is. It shakes a person's um, foundation. And I always say the group is only as strong as each person anyway, the individual. The, right. the, if, each, in, if each person is strong, and whole, the stronger the group will be. And why why would you want a group that doesn't grow? And it's just it becomes just one mind thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if if in a group, for example, even when we do when we do workshops and uh, so on, everybody's allowed to express their uh, angle, their opinion, all of that, and it adds to and then it gives everybody uh, something to think about like hmm i never thought about it that way and it just adds to well that makes everybody grow yeah as opposed to everybody just having to just have this set belief and nobody can add anything to it that's religion yeah. all over again it's religion and it's also like you know if an idea or if a cohesive idea right that a group is bound together by really is a good idea then having a few dissenters in the group should sharpen, should make your, you know, like your argument less attackable for outside or whatever your premise is or whatever, right? And then there's this, you know, I love the idea of like, we can disagree, we can have a debate and we can aggressively disagree. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards we can have a, have a drink and move on to the next topic. And it right. doesn't have to become this thing that like, you are like, some doesn't sort have to of be combative or, you know, doesn't have to be combative. and also like, there's no, um, you know, if you can, if two people can disagree about someone and somebody can watch that argument, right. Somebody else from the outside or somebody who's, you know, can look at that argument and, and watch the people behave, behaves perspectively. And one or the other of them in the, who's participating in the argument is somehow swayed or moved in their position. Mm. Then to me, that becomes a, a better way to appeal to people who are outside of the group than just this mono, you know, like this. Right. Yeah. Forcing, forcing your opinion on somebody that turn, that's a turnoff. So even if you have a valid point to share mm -hmm. that may help that person to maybe even see a bigger picture. Well, they're immediately, their defenses are going to go up. And so they're not even going to hear you because everybody is always ready to defend their point. You know, that's what we do. That's part of our survival program is we have our own mind army. And, and so because of that, yeah. we're always on guard and we're always ready for, you know, attack. It's like, you know, uh, give, you know, give the yeah. order to, you know, to do what to, to, to shoot. So that's something that we have to think about. But if we are so solid in what we will understand, and when I say solid, I don't mean solid to a point where you're like you can't hear anything else but you're solid in your foundation enough to be able to have an open mind to listen and maybe that person might say 
just one thing, what two words that spark an expansion of what you what you know. I mean, I've had I have that happen so many times, and it's like, wow, that just added some dimension to what what I already view. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh wow, I didn't really think of that, think of it that way, and you add to it. Because that's to me in the end, that's, that's all you're about is for me is about expanding beyond well, this prescribed version of reality. Exercising your mind, right? Like, you know, sometimes like, even if you think somebody is totally kooky and wrong about something, mm -hmm. expanding your mind to the place where you can see, like sometimes there's someone I d disagree with, mm -hmm. but the logic train, they chain or train, however you prefer mm -hmm. it, they follow to get to where they got makes sense and so if you can allow yourself to like step out of your own vision of, of what is and into theirs because they may have taken their logical chain of thinking a few steps farther than right. yours and the, learning to wrap your mind around that now mm -hmm. creates more space for you to go to the next level with your thoughts about things yes. right so for me I, I really enjoy banter with somebody that I can have uh, a friendly disagreement with because you know it, it, it shows me something about my mind Right. You know, and, and, you know, yeah, like the more ideas, the more concepts that I can get under the tent, whether they be correct or incorrect, the, the more things I can consider, then, I mean, this is a very vast mm, simulation. We live in. I was going to say world, but right. right. So like the more things, you know, the more things that can be sort of integrated or included into what you, um, you know, what you can know. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, then I don't understand why you know why you would want to eliminate the possibility that they can exist, even if it doesn't. Because it's not comfortable, yeah. and again, yeah. it interferes with your need um, to to be right and certain. And yeah, but case in point, you know, we saw this like even at the retreat that you know it was we even had those moments where we're hearing you know people. Um, there was a couple couple situations where like, well, no, I don't really think so, and then I heard the person who was defending the situation suddenly went, you know what? I, I hadn't thought of it that way. And that person was that like free and okay to go, wow, okay, you gave me a, a different way to look at it. I, I can see that. So then that shifted that person's thought process to begin with. And to me, at the end of the day, what most of us anyway, the people that I connect with like yourself and people that come to re the retreat, are people who are on this journey to just expand. So ego, it just doesn't really, there's no room for it in that sense. Like, you know, because it just makes you stuck. Sure, we have to have ego, but I'm talking about ego to a point where you can't hear anything and then uh -huh. that shuts off your expansion. But when we get together, it's all about taking ourselves to the next level. You know, yeah. what conversations will take place that will take us to the next level, uh, each each of us to the next level. And to me, that's 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 what we're you know that's the, should be the target point, uh, because that's how we're going to penetrate this um, this version. And I keep, I use that word all the time, this version of reality, because it's all it is. It's a version that we're running, a uh, particular interpretation of reality that we've been experiencing in our bodies, uh, you know, and just mm -hmm. in our general experience. So, yeah, so that becomes um, absolutely necessary. The people that talk about escaping, which we've talked about before, um, again, I keep saying there is no escaping. There's, there's expansion. There is expansion of awareness that transcends the, that limiting human experience that you may be having. That's all that you're doing. You're not disqualifying reality and the version of reality that you were experiencing that may have been a limited version but you're basically looking at the fact of how it served you you have now we've each had an opportunity to know what that feels like to operate from that limited per perception and perspective where we don't remember how to be magical how to produce you know, things out of thin air, meaning the science, we're now coming back into that understanding. So it's not escaping, it's becoming, um, it's, I'm going to use the word in a way, overriding the, the, mm -hmm. your, your vibration and your, your frequency, the frequency of your understanding begins to override 
the frequency that supports that specific limiting version um, of the game experienced by, by collective as we know the collective to be. Yeah, absolutely. And as we kind of wind down to the end of the first hour here, you know, we, oh, I always kind of like to touch on this with you because I think this is probably one of the most important ideas that you present. And I'm wondering if we've talked a lot about like this creation, this theme of, of create, creating this frailty, right? It feeds really deeply into the most important theme that they insist everybody sort of latch onto, and that is the theme of death. When you see, like, I mean, we were walking the other day, and there's all these billboards for like this new movie that's like looks like a, I can't remember what it was called, but it's like a girl version of Chucky. It looks like a mm. demon possessed doll, and she's like possess them all. And there's all of this, so much worship of death in this culture. There are cultures that their whole thing, like with some of the Latin cultures with the Day of the Dead stuff, right, mm -hmm. and all the, um, you know, that kind of thing, like. All of it seems like all of these diminishing themes and programs are really part of preparing people for the ultimate program, which is the death program. And mm -hmm. I think everybody, whenever when when I talk, when I get into conversations about you and your work with people, the one people seem to like not really be able to get their head around is this idea of death as a program. And you right. did talk about the death program in this article about themes. So, can you just kind of touch on that briefly in terms of? of that being really the ultimate theme that sort of underrides this. <laughs> this, uh, yeah. this She's situation. like, can you talk about that for like a minute, uh, a half minute? You have about 10 you minutes. Know, and yet, because th th it is like the biggest one for people it's to wrap their yeah. minds around. It, you know, and, and I guess I am. I'm known for speaking about this. Um, I, I am known for going into uh, depth about this. All the workshops I've done, they go deeper and deeper into this idea. And um, I sent an article, uh, a link to an article today to um, to the people that are in this workshop that I this, this workshop series that's going on right now about time and um, physical exploration or something like that. And in and it's like Freud was also onto the idea of this death, um, this death urge. I think he coined that term, the death urge. Mm -hmm. That pretty much everything we do. Um, is is death driven mm -hmm. now for, i think people are programmed with wanting to be free so there's this idea we're constantly as human beings seeking a, a, a level of freedom we don't quite get it but there's a freedom and i think death got associated with the idea of freedom or the the uh pathway to some sort of freedom i think this has been a, the core program uh, and so when people think of it, it's like, yeah, it's the ultimate, it's the surrender. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, but ultimately we're going to, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen and we're just going to go and hopefully we go to a better place. So, so there is this idea of freedom that really is attached to it. Now to talk about it, God, I don't even, honestly, Emily, I don't even know where, where to begin in the sense of people who are so unfamiliar with any of this, the idea of dying. Um, oh, sorry. I have a construction man in the backyard who's trying to signal. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm listening to you. You know, the idea of, of dying and people need to understand their age. What we're talking about is, is cycles. You know, if we, if we get rid of saying, you know, okay, our, our age or how old we are, but we look at it, that it's 365 days according to the matrix programmed um, uh, quantifying then of time. We have a calendar that is obviously, the, regardless of what calendar it is, it's hooked up with the um, this cosmic network then, um, as we know this cosmic ne network to be, and the cycling of our planet. So what we're looking at is 365 days. That's one cycle. And then we get a bunch of those. And then now we say you're 10 years old. That's 10 cycles. And I started to tell people, I'm like, look at it in cycles. When you start to look at what's, what your existence here in these cycles, that in a quiet way starts to even remove this idea of, of aging and getting old. You're living these cycles. Now what has happened is, we have been operating off of a um, what I refer to as a default program. Um, 
uh, our minds, we are wired into a default system. Now, somebody says, well, what is, what is that? What does that mean? Well, when you think about it, something knows in this network mechanism, knows that after so many cycles, a girl's menstrual cycle will begin. Well, what kicks that on? You start thinking about it. What is it that kicks this, this mechanism that you call a body on? Because that's what we're talking about. People get confused. We're talking about the body. It's the body that expires. That which we are does not expire. It, it, it really has no, it's just a timeless essence, right? But we are occupying these vehicle, a signature aspect of this vastness that we are then, which we refer to as the consciousness that occupies, that owns this vehicle. There's a signature essence that we call Emily and Sonia. Yep. Um, and that essence, that signature has established this vehicle, my vehicle, vehicle that is specific to that signature of the, of the Sonia consciousness system. And so something counts us, something, something is keeping track of these cycles that lets the, that, that turns the body on mechanisms in the body, the hormones in the body, which are all operating off this day and night cycle. Everything comes back to that day and night cycle because, mm -hmm. you know, it all spins that way. Day comes, you know, the whole cycle, boom, one other day. And those days become 365 days. So after so many of those moon cycles, let's say, um, the default system is, is programmed in that manner because everybody's hooked up to it that the human body will begin to move into uh, a reproduct reproductive um, capabilities. The, that part of the brain, everything is shut on at a particular time for reproduction. Um, and so you, you look at that. Now, now, what happens then later when this idea of menopause, which are, these are all ab abnormal really, um, happens, now we're in the cycle, this program of after so many cycles, then this thing happens called menopause. So all, what I'm trying to get people to see just right now, I'm not even trying to get you to understand the big, 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 big picture. But what I'm trying to get you to see is that there has to be a system in place that is causing the vehicle to activate and to move into these specific programs based on the a certain number of cycles and it happens like that across the globe um there are times sure when girls start menstruating earlier but overall there is a period there of time there's that cycle between um uh what is it uh, 12 11 11 and 13 mm -hmm. and I, I actually figured that out and I did a, I did a workshop on that where everybody was able to figure out these seven year cycles. It's, it's, a, it's a whole mathematical formula that's involved, but for all intents and purposes, it happens generally right around that particular time. So just look at that. Something is counting you and every moment, you know, every second that supposed clock ticks, leads us to what a second and a minute mm -hmm. and, and an hour and that's all it is all these moments become you know bigger moments 24 hours and that 24 hours eventually becomes seven of those 24 hours you know and then a seven of those 24 hours eventually become 365 um days and there was something else that i wanted to to mention about um Oh God, I wanted to mention about that. Uh, but anyway, there is, I, I call it a default program. And once we begin to understand more um, profoundly, we realize that when I talk about the version of reality we're running, that is a prime example. That is a version of reality we're running. That is a, our birth, the birth to death program of reality, which works because that system works, that system in place of these cycles work. 
And when the idea of menopause, science is even trying to understand that because they don't understand why a woman's body shuts off because it's not, it shouldn't. Um, and, and the word pause comes into play. It's so there's, pause, right? It's not going to stop. It's menopause. There's, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so we have these pause points for specific kind of changeover, but here's the trick. The default system will always run if the, the owner of that vehicle is still in a state of unawareness, just like um, astrology, you know, sure, it all works. It's, it's, it's valid. When you are a sleeping human, it is more relevant to your journey because mm -hmm. it's part of the default construct. When we move beyond that, when we awaken, we're like, okay, then those programs no longer have to run default. The default has to happen because it's how it keeps the human being going when it's on auto. So yeah. the default program supports an automated process because human beings are most people anyway are technically in a in a in an unaware state so it has to count them and it shuts them down and it puts them into expiration at a particular time particularly when there is no evolution and expansion to the being we must have expansion there that's why we have um, the idea of brain plasticity that you can grow your brain, that you can uh, expand your awareness. All of that kind of deep expansion is absolutely necessary to begin to override the default system. Now the default program, the automated program, no longer has to be the deciding factor to keep the human being going. And it's really important, and I'll say this and I'll end it, but. It's really important that we make the distinction. We understand that the body, we are not the totality of this. So when people say, oh, they have a hard time with the idea of you know, not dying, it's because they've taken all of who they think they are, the body and the expansive aspect of, of who they are, that, that essence that puppets this, and they've condensed all of who they are into their body, not recognizing, because some people say, yeah, they get it intellectually or just on the surface. No, when you understand this, you realize the body is a technology, a vehicle. It is a vessel. It is not the totality of who I am. It is an aspect of that more expansive part of me reduced to form this vehicle that will operate in the environment that this this that supports this particular experience that we call earth all the gaseous laws it has been designed to process all of these gaseous laws and it's a sensory system so the only way that we can interact with our environment and these experiences is to experience the the sensation of all of our emotions and our feelings. This is why we're in these vehicles. Stop making the mistake of thinking, oh yeah, you know, well, I've gotta die. Who has to die? You're, you're really talking about your body. You're, you're, you're living as, you, as the automated version of yourself. When you are thinking that way, you have to snap out of it and realize, oh wow, that is the automated version. I need to get back in the driver's seat. That part of me needs to get back in the driver's seat. And that's when, these changes start to come about and you've given permission now for the brain to begin to, um, to uh, allow, expose you to all that it already has access to. And then the consciousness starts to change. The consciousness changes, the vibration of the consciousness changes. It's going to begin to change the vibration of the actual physical um, body itself. So I hope that I was able to do a crash version and for, make for sense out of it. For once in my life, I have almost nothing to say. Ladies and gentlemen, the very brilliant Sonia Barrett, that was actually really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could add or make that any better. That was a brilliant kind of summary of that. And we'll continue to touch on that as we talk about other topics in the future. So this is, uh, brings us to the end of the public hour. Do uh, you want to tell people where they can find you and what you have going on? Um, yes, therealsoniabarrett.com. 
um, is the easiest place to find me. By the way, I'm going to be in Seattle in July. It's, the information is on the website. I'm speaking at um, the um, East West um, Bookshop. They sponsored um, me talking there. So I'll be there for two days and uh, in July and also at the, in the Bay Area. The East West Bookshop also in the Bay Area towards the end of July. All the information is on the real Sonia Barrett. Um, dot com and uh, yeah, lots of other things, workshops and all that stuff. It's all on the real Sonia Barrett dot com. And if you haven't seen the business of disease yet, please go ahead and watch it. The business of disease dot com. Yes, please do everybody. It was excellent. That's actually what sort of led to Sonia and I, you know, eventually connecting to it's a really important film. And for those of you who are going to join us over in the patrons hour, uh, we are going to talk, uh, we're going to hit on one specific theme, and that's a, that is the theme of uh, relationships expiring. And then we are going to get into, there are low, no, no laws except for the laws that there are no laws. <laughs> <Right? laughs> are there laws or are there no laws? Which one is it? And that, the paradox of that. And for those of you that have not joined us yet over on Patreon, please do. Uh, it's uh, patreon.com forward slash media. For those of you who support us, we really, really appreciate it. We will see you on the other side. We'll be back in just a minute. All right. Thank you. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.